are the top 10 drivers of all time? We'll profile each of them as we bring you the results of our exclusive poll in this edition of NASCAR Video Magazine. We'll also visit with rising superstar and winner of the 1991 Daytona 500, Ernie Irvin. That's when you find out how big the Daytona 500 is. Our racing legend for this issue, Supertex, A.J. Foyt. I guess this is something I guess I was born to race. host, Benny Parsons, will share war stories with the legendary Wood Brothers, masters of the super speedway. Hello everyone, I'm Benny Parsons and welcome to this edition of NASCAR Video Magazine. In this and every volume, I'm going to take you to the front row of the action, as well as behind the scenes in a way that's not available anywhere else. I'm hosting this very special issue, focusing on the greatest drivers in the history of our sport from NASCAR's most historic track, Darlington International Raceway. She's over 40 years old and still too tough to tame. In NASCAR Rewind, we'll travel back in time to the fabled and feared Langhorne Speedway in Pennsylvania, one of the most controversial tracks in NASCAR history. Our tech report takes us behind closed doors at the GM Test Center, where teams search for ways to race faster against the wind. We'll take an in-depth look at NASCAR's Winston Racing Series, where serious professionals and weekend warriors compete on short tracks across the nation. And once again, my good buddy, Daryl Walter will reveal some driving secrets to help you drive like a pro. Let's get to it, and no better place to start than with our look at the 10 greatest stock car drivers of all time. Who are they? That's a question that will be debated for as long as people get behind the wheel and race for a checkered flag. And there's never going to be a definitive answer, but we decided to ask some people who should know, top racing journalists from all across the country. Throughout this issue, we'll reveal who they selected, and we'll profile each of their picks. And we'll also look at some of today's top drivers who have a shot to make their way on this list before their careers are over. The man who finished 10th in our exclusive poll was a pioneer in the sport of stock car racing. He grew up on fast cars and came out of a small North Carolina town of Randleman to become a three-time series champion and win more races on dirt than anyone in NASCAR history. He was there when the sport made the transition from local tracks to super speedways. And with his smooth, calculating style, now though he didn't mind shoving a bit, if it was necessary, won the first Daytona 500 in 1959, just one of his 54 career NASCAR victories. He was voted for this list for his accomplishments behind the wheel, and deservedly so, though today living comfortably in retirement in Level Cross, many know him best for the two men who picked up the gauntlet of his winning tradition and carried it onwards his son Richard, his grandson Kyle, the driver, you guessed it, Lee Petty. When it came to pure nerve and seat of the pants driving ability, no one had more of either than the man who finished ninth in our survey, the legendary Curtis Turner. This man was an absolute daredevil. Although the record book only shows 18 Grand National wins, he had another 38 wins in NASCAR's tough convertible division but that hardly tells the whole story. Those who knew him remember one of the most outgoing characters in NASCAR history. But maybe what says the most about this remarkable driver was when you ask the men who drove against him what they remember, they speak of a man who was as tough a competitor as any they faced. Who was the toughest driver you ever raced against? Curtis Turner. There's no tougher, no tougher. It's fitting that Turner's first win came on a course that demanded all of the skills of the talented driver. The place, Langhorne Raceway in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. But this legendary track from NASCAR's past is worth remembering for more than Turner's victory. Jerry Punch 
has the story. In 1991, the Winston Cup drivers compete on some challenging tracks across America, such as The Rock, the North Carolina Motor Speedway, Darlington, the track too tough to tame, the Monster Mile at Dover, Delaware, and the high banks of Bristol. But if you look back to the early days of NASCAR and ask what was the toughest track they ever saw, many of the old timers will simply say Langhorn. The Langhorn Speedway in Langhorn, Pennsylvania was famous in its later years for hosting the annual Race of Champions for open wheel modified cars. But if you go back to NASCAR's first year of existence in 1949, you'll find the fourth race in NASCAR history was run there. The track was described as the Great Left Turn, a one mile circle track. Not an oval, but a circle. The Grand National Series ran at Langhorn 17 times from 1949 through 1957, and it certainly earned the respect of everyone who competed there. Langhorn was, other than uh, Darlington, was that one of our biggest races. You know, we'd run a, a 200 miler up there, dirt, and it's a mile dirt, and it was a complete circle. You kind of, you had one little spot on the back stretch, you got straightened out for a little bit. The rest of the track is kind of in a broad slide all the way around the racetrack. It was, uh, for a dirt track, it was a pretty hairy race, a fast racetrack, and uh, it probably uh, more drivers bit the dust at Langhorn than any other racetrack, I guess, in the United States. It was a challenge to go there. I, I love the racetrack. It was a, almost a pure round racetrack, and you could keep a car hanging in a broad slide for a solid mile, and you never did come out of that if you got out of it you'd get run off the left because that was a trick to run in that place was keep a car sideways the whole mile around it. And that's the way you love to run those cars sideways, right? Well, if I couldn't see the rear quarter panel when I was looking out the right side, I didn't think I had it hung out far enough. <laughs> Herb Thomas had three of his 48 career wins at the Pennsylvania track. Buck Baker was a two-time winner there, as was Tim Flock. And the driver who won more dirt NASCAR races than anyone, Lee Petty, he had one win there. In the track's later years, it was crowded out by subdivisions and shopping centers, and a true part of American auto racing history was lost. So as we look back on the glory days of Langhorn, it's a real reminder of the brave and daring competitors that make up NASCAR's rich heritage. You know Langhorn was tough when you hear a driver as great as Junior Johnson talk about it that way. When it comes to respect, there are few that have more of it in our sport than Junior. And our survey of top journalists selected him as the eighth greatest driver in the history of stock car racing. And no history of the sport could possibly be complete without him. He was there when NASCAR got started. And the legend of the man from Ingle Hollow was born in fast cars along back roads in North Carolina. Throughout his career, he was known as a man who'd run wide open. And if his car held up, he was usually first to the checkered flag. He had 50 NASCAR wins during his career, including the 1960 Daytona 500. As a driver, this white number three was the most famous car that Junior ever drove. In 1963, he won seven races in this car. Word is Ford spent millions of dollars trying to defeat this one Chevrolet. He retired at age 34 in 1966, but he's never lost his taste for racing. And today, he's one of Winston Cup's most successful car owners, a quiet man it said when one of his drivers asked for advice during a recent race, he simply said, go to the front. You may recall in our last issue, Fred Lorenzen talked about the profound influence Fireball Roberts had on him. In fact, there isn't a driver who ever competed against Fireball that could forget the experience. Fireball Roberts was chosen in our poll as the seventh greatest stock car driver ever. Few people know it, but he got his nickname not behind the wheel, but at the mound of his high school baseball team. He could bring the fastball, but not surprisingly, when he got to the track, the name stuck. An early master of the super speedway, he had 34 career wins, including the 1962 Daytona 500. In 1963, Ford hired Fireball to drive this car, and one of Fireball's biggest wins ever came at Darlington in this car in the 1963 Southern 500 averaging a remarkable 129.784 miles per hour. His name was synonymous with speed, and I would say he was the Dale Earnhardt of his day.
when people start talking about great drivers, one name that always comes up is A.J. Foyt. Now, although he didn't make our stock car list, there's no doubt that when it comes to all-around greatness amongst motorsports drivers, Supertex is one of the best. A four-time winner at Indianapolis, he is the only Indy driver to have also run in more than 100 NASCAR stock car races. He first came to NASCAR in 1963 and had competed in 25 consecutive Daytona 500s before injuries sustained in his Indy car kept him out in 1991. He has seven NASCAR wins, including the 1965 Firecracker 400 and the 1972 Daytona 500. I had a chance to visit with AJ at his home in Houston and look back at his time spent in a stock car. Was you born to race? <laughs> I can't answer that, but it seemed like ever since I've been on this earth, I've wanted to race. You know, I started driving cars when I was about three years old. My father, you know, had race cars back years back, and uh, I guess it's just something I guess I was born to race. It's the only thing you've really truly ever wanted to do in your life, isn't it? Just it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do and, and still want to do, and even though I know the times is coming to the end, uh, I still want to do it. In Foyt's early days, he quickly established himself as one of racing's premier open-wheel drivers. Then in 1963, with one Indy 500 victory already under his belt, he added stock car racing to his busy schedule. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't know. I guess I just love the racing and all different types of it. I know it's hard to stay on top at all types of racing, but it was still a challenge, you know. It's still a challenge today, so... Uh, I felt like if you can win in one car and you can win in another, that just puts another feather in your cap. AJ, you're the only guy that has ever been successful in all forms of racing. Win the Indianapolis 500, won the Daytona 500, won the 24 Hours of Le Mans, Sebring, 24 Hours of Daytona. You know, I just can't imagine how thrilled you must be to have went to all different divisions and, and not conquered them all, but won all of them. Well, I guess like you say, it, it's been something I worked hard for. It wasn't easy like a lot of people thought, but it's something that uh, I'm glad and just had good Lord willing that everything fell my way where I was fortunate enough to win each class of the races because it didn't come like a lot of people thinks, you know, just magic. And I've always felt like you make your own luck on a racetrack, even though a lot of times it looks bad. Uh, and like I say, uh, it's very proud to know that a lot of people talk, uh, why haven't you quit, you know, way long time ago. But I enjoy racing. I still think I got a win or two left in me, or I wouldn't be there. Boy, it's 30 plus year career has been relatively safe but he's had his share of scary moments, like in 1965 at Riverside, when he lost his brakes in turn 11, causing a spectacular crash. He sustained multiple injuries, including a broken back. What I tried to do, if you look back, we didn't have nothing on the back straightaway. I tried to embed it down in 11, you know, it had that big hole in it. I tried to embed the car down in the bottom of that. I think it would have worked good, but as I went to go off the racetrack, it had a dip in the racetrack. And if you look back at the pictures, you can see the car go airborne. Right there when it went airborne, <laughs> I knew I was in deep trouble. <laughs> it was out of my hands, and uh, I felt like I'd have run through Junior Johnson because he was breaking in the corner, and uh, I'd have run, you know, clean through him, and possible it could have took both our lives. So the way it turned out, it turned out good, you know. It, I didn't hurt nobody else but myself, and... I told him next time I was teasing him, I said, next time I might use you for a break down there. But I don't know, if I had the situation, I'd probably do the same thing again. Foyt has competed with the best drivers in stock car history, from Fireball to Earnhardt. AJ has seen them all. I asked him who he thought was the best. Actually, uh, you know, I didn't ever really race that much against Fireball, but I remember his name real well. I'd have to say uh, Fred Lorenz, when I was going down there, was really the hot dog down south in the stock car racing. And actually, Junior Johnson. I remember me and him had a hell of a race at Atlanta one time. We was running two Chevrolets. I was driving for Smokey Eunuch, and uh, Junior uh, was driving for himself and running the Chevrolet. And <clears throat> Junior stood on the gas pretty hard down there. 
I didn't, you know, couldn't run that many stock car races, but uh, I'd have to say he was probably one of the hardest down there to beat when you go down there. You know, when I when people mention to me great race car drivers, the first name that pops in my head is A.J. Foyt because the fact that you've done it in all kinds of race cars. And when people think of A.J. Foyt, what would you like for him to remember those, all those years of? <laughs> well, I don't know. I've, all the races through the years I went to, when I'd go out on a promotion deal to run a midget or sprint, I like people to realize that I give 100% every time I went out. And uh, that's about it, because, you know, when I quit, my days are over with, and uh, just go back to low-key normal life, I guess. And uh, one thing about it, like I said, uh, I've always tried, even when I'd go out and run the midgets, I'd win some of them, lose some of them. But I never went there for appearance money, just collect appearance money and say, well, the car could run in or something. A lot of guys have done that through the years, and that's one thing I made a point to never do. AJ had his biggest NASCAR wins while driving for the Wood Brothers. The driver who placed sixth in our experts poll got his first super speedway win in 1967 when he was driving for the Woods. He's fourth on NASCAR's all-time win list with 83 wins. On the track, he was known as a tough and tenacious competitor and who flourished both on short tracks and super speedways. Carol Yarbrough is the only driver to ever win three Winston Cup championships in a row, and he did it driving for Junior Johnson. The match was perfect. Their philosophy was the same. These days, he's still charging in NASCAR competition as a car owner of the Trop Arctic Pontiac. Number five on the list, he won another vote with fans picking him as NASCAR's most popular driver in the past two seasons. Darrell Walter, a three-time Winston Cup champion in the 80s and currently fifth on the all-time win list, Walter has changed the image of her sport with his outgoing nature and articulate presentation. He may not be the most talented, pure driver among the top 10, but ask anyone and they'll tell you it's hard to find a driver who's smarter or more calculated. He's a master tactician equally adapt on the short tracks and super speedways. Inside the slick package is a man with a powerful will to win. He's bounced back from last season's injury and with his new Western Auto Car, seems certain to solidify his position as one of the greatest drivers ever. We all know Darrell had to wait 17 years for his first Daytona 500 win, but this year's winner made it to victory lane at Dayton in only his third try. It was a big win for an emerging star. Ernie Irvin is a driver to watch in 1991 and beyond. <music> Following Ernie's win at Daytona, I had the opportunity to visit with Ernie at his home outside Charlotte to learn more about the man many are calling NASCAR's next superstar. Ernie, you knew that the Daytona 500 was a big deal. Did you realize it was as big a deal as it is? No, not really, Benny. You know, um, I always heard the Daytona 500, it's the biggest event we ever go to. Well, yeah, I looked at the entry form and, man, I knew it was a big event, you know. I mean, that's, Kenny Schrader taught me, man, first thing you do is look and see how much that race pays. And, um, you know, I, I knew it was big in that aspect, but, you know, but um, to leave the Daytona 500 and and to have um, as many requests as I did when I got home as far as to do news deals, do David Letterman show, um, you know, just numerous things. And um, that's when you find out how big the Daytona 500 is and, and how big a reaction it has. I mean, it was in Sports Illustrated, which, you know, I mean, racing just doesn't get very much uh, things in magazines like that. And, um, you know, just every time I talk to somebody on the West Coast, you know, they say, oh, well, we saw your, you're on the cover of this or you're on the cover of that. And it's like, Man, it's like the only thing I've ever been on the cover of Stock Car Magazine, you know, so, so it, it's definitely a big deal. Like so many other stock car drivers, Ernie became interested in the sport through his father. My dad actually started racing in 1959, the year I was born. And the whole time I was growing up, um, I worked at the wrecking yard. My dad had a wrecking yard and um, worked at the wrecking yard and, you know, learned a lot of things about business and cars and, um, 
just you know lots of odds and ends and he had to a lot of times he had the race race car there and we got to work on the race car a little bit you know i was a kid so i didn't get to do much but he always had this quarter midget sitting in the garage and he always told me that was my quarter midget so when i turned eight years old he decided he was going to take me to this quarter midget track and let me race ernie eventually became successful at go-kart winning several california titles then at the ripe age of 16 he started racing stock cars and continued to win I raced uh, five races the first year I ran, and I won one. And then the, when I was 17, I raced 10 races and won two. And then when I turned the when I turned 18, we had bought a car from Ivan Baldwin. Um, it, you know, the basically best car you could buy at the time. I um, went to Stockton. We we're going to run a full season. Me and my mom. My dad was out racing at dirt tracks, and so he didn't get to come. But me and my mom would go racing. Oh, your mom was behind this as well? Yeah, oh yeah. My mom was kind of my pit crew at the time because my dad couldn't go. So my mom would, we'd leave on a Friday. I'd load the car up on Thursday night. I'd go to school on Friday. Mom would drive by, pick me up at school. We'd leave and go to Madeira and run Madeira on Friday night. And that was, you know, it, it didn't pay much. And, and that was just a good place for us to get more experience. We won quite a few races there. And then we'd go and we'd stay at a KOA camp on Friday night after the race in Madeira, work on the car all day Saturday morning and afternoon, drive to Stockton, which was another 120 miles, and race there on Saturday nights, and then drive home on Saturday nights and be home on Sunday. When, when you were 10, 12 years old, I know you was racing a go-kart, but your little buddies that you played with, did you, did you just race or did you play baseball, football, basketball? Well, Benny, I, I kind of grew up with, with one guy. His name was Timmy Williamson. And, um, he, he lived right by my dad's wrecking yard, and his brother worked in my dad's wrecking yard, and Timmy was racing go-karts, and I was racing go-karts, and um, we, we grew up together. I mean, that's basically where I hung out all the time. If I didn't go to the wrecking yard, I was at Timmy's house spending the night or whatever, working on go-karts, and that was our thing was, was go-karts at the time, and uh, Timmy was a couple years older than I was, and he went into stock cars. Tragically, Tim Williamson was killed in a stock car race at Riverside, a race that Ernie was competing in himself. Ernie still misses Tim and thinks about him often. To lose Timmy then was, was devastating, but I think it hurts me now more than any time. I mean, I catch myself like a Daytona this time. Actually, after Bristol, when I won Bristol, Timmy got more in my mind. I started thinking more about him than, than I ever had. You know, even now, now I really realize what I had lost, such a good friend. and. And I looked through the garage area wondering which car he'd be driving right now because I knew he was that good of a racer and, and he would be in one. I, I mean, I may look at the Quaker State car thinking, well, I wonder if he'd be in that because that's the type of racer he was. He, he was going to be around for a long time. He may have already been a Winston Cup champion. We don't know. But, you know, I mean, even this weekend, I looked at Richmond. After winning Daytona 500, I went to Richmond. That was one of the first thoughts I had was, you know, it would be neat if he was here. Ernie moved to Concord, North Carolina in 1984 to be with his dad. He immediately dominated the dirt track at Concord Motor Speedway. His first Winston Cup ride was at Richmond in 1987. He ran an abbreviated schedule that year with a highlight being an eighth place finish at Charlotte. 1988 and 89 were uneventful for Ernie and 1990 wasn't going to be any better until he got a phone call from car owner Larry McClure. Well, you know, I wanted to play hard to get. But when you're sitting there with, with, you know, like a couple cans of pork and beans in the, in the refrigerator and not much else, you, you know, you, you're hard to play hard to get. So, yeah, I'd be real interested in it. So Larry, Larry and myself worked out a deal to go test the car at Atlanta and see if we could work together. And there's, you know, there's a lot of things that make a team work. And so we went to Atlanta to test the car. Third lap on the racetrack, I'd run within about two tenths as fast as they'd ever been in at Atlanta. And there's water on the track still, and I'm just kind of not really running hard. There's water running down the track. And, and Tony's, I mean, Tony, I'd come in, he's got a smile on his face, you know, and he goes, well, can you go any faster? Yeah, I can go a little faster if you want, but that, that water's a little edgy. It slips through there pretty good, you know, and it's like, this is at about 170, you know. So by the time we left there that day, we had run, I can't remember the exact time, but it was, it was fast enough to be like third or fourth fast for the race before and was pretty pumped up because we'd run through the water and there was about 15 cars there testing and we were four tenths quicker than anybody there. So Larry and myself went back and, and we pretty much worked all the details out for our contract and, and you basically what he wanted to set up and 
we come back to Atlanta, rained out qualifying, um, started 30th in the race and ran third. So um, from then on, it's just been great. What's next? What's your goal? Championship? More races? What? Win, win more races. Um, learn to be more consistent. Um, you know, you, you can't go to Daytona, win the 500, then come to Richmond and run 27th. That's not good. So we've got to get the consistency there. You know, um, you know, obviously this year I want to finish in the top five in points, win five or six races. Obviously I want to win the championship, but I mean, I would be pretty satisfied with the top five in points and, and win up to five races. After winning the Daytona 500, Ernie talked about how just five years ago he was running in the Winston Racing Series. Jerry Punch has a story of what the Winston Racing Series is all about. One of the most common questions asked in the Winston Cup garage area by would-be drivers is where can I get started in racing? It may surprise you to find the best place to start is close to your own backyard. It's called the Winston Racing Series. This series has a combination of weekend warriors and future superstars. The series is made up of nearly 90 tracks that operate in 37 states. Drivers compete on asphalt and dirt on the short tracks that are the real grassroots of American racing. The series celebrates its 10th anniversary in 1991 and already has some impressive graduates. The Winston Racing Series is one of the most competitive series in the country. You got the best of the short track drivers all over the country running the series. It does a lot for your future. It taught me how to race hard, how to win, and taught me how to lose also. And without the Winston Racing Series, I surely couldn't have won a bush race and sat on two poles by now. The series is broken down into eight regions, with each having its own champion. Current Bush Grand National star Elton Sawyer is a former Mid Atlantic Regional Champion. You know, in 1983 and 1984, when I won the regional titles, uh, you know, ran primarily at Langley Speedway in Hampton and Southside Speedway in Richmond. The exposure through running through that series gave me the opportunity to run this Bush Grand National Series now. The 1990 national champion was Max Prestwood Jr. of Lenore, North Carolina, who won an amazing 35 times in 40 starts. His national championship prizes total over $65,000. The Winston Racing Series is not only a great place to get started, but also a great way to follow your dream of driving in competitive cars and competing for a national championship of your own. If you've had an opportunity to visit a racetrack, no matter how small, there's a good chance that the driver who finished fourth in a pole has raced there, and probably won. He stirred on the all-time win list and was the 1983 Winston Cup champion, Bobby Allison. In his prime racing days, Allison raced five nights a week, 10 months out of the year. He flat out loved to drive a race car. He lived for that car, and morning till night was always thinking about ways to make it go faster, and handle better. On the track, I don't think there was anyone who could get a car to handle like Bobby. Man, he was smooth. His last win came in the 1988 Daytona 500 in an emotional victory over his son, Davey. A six-time most popular driver, his recovery from a racing accident is one of the sport's greatest and most satisfying comeback stories. And believe me, the main man of the Alabama gang is back as owner of the Hus Strickland Buick. Bobby was not only a great driver, but he was relentless in doing everything he could to improve the handling and performance of his car. And one of the ways to do this is mastering aerodynamics. Racing against the wind is constantly challenging the Winston Cup competitors. And in this special report, Chris McCour goes behind closed doors at General Motors to tell us just how high tech the battle has become. It wasn't until the Daytona International Speedway opened in 1959 that the concept of aerodynamics and drafting became part of the NASCAR language. 
U.S. automakers have made many attempts over the years to give their drivers in NASCAR an advantage with new, sleek, clean aerodynamic shapes. Probably the most radical attempt came in 1970 when the Chrysler Corporation introduced the Plymouth Superbird and Dodge Daytona Charger. Those designs were dedicated almost strictly to racing, but now, with concerns about fuel economy and handling, the top priority of the country's automaking engineers, we've found the technology used by Buick to make their passenger cars efficient can also be a tremendous asset to its Winston Cup racing program. We're standing inside the General Motors Aerodynamic Laboratory at the GM Tech Center in Warren, Michigan. The man to my left, Gary Aker, the senior project engineer. Most specifically, we're with a laser analysis unit. And Gary, what exactly are we going to see here? Well, this laser beam is going to track over the periphery of the car. The idea is to give us an accurate picture of how big the car is, how big a hole it's going to punch in the wind. Okay, once they roll this car up here on the platform, what happens? What's the procedure? Just talk us through that. Okay. Well, the operator will line the laser beam up, and it'll track up the side of the car, and the laser beam itself will always be tracking on the widest point of the vehicle at any given time. And so it'll measure over the outside of the car, but that's not the whole picture, because if you look down the, from the front of the car, there's a little hole underneath. And so he'll index it on the inside, and then essentially cut out that hole where the air was allowed to go under the car. And then the computer will simply calculate the area based on the size of that projected view. State-of-the-art laser analysis is an important part of the aerodynamic package. Another part is this huge wind tunnel that can generate wind speeds up to 170 miles an hour. The wind tunnel measures a total aerodynamic force. Well, obviously, the faster the wind, the higher the force is going to be. Typically, the larger the object, the higher the force is going to be. So what we do is you measure the aerodynamic force. Then you factor in the speed at which the air is blowing and the frontal area that the car has. And then that tells you the aerodynamic uh, drag or lift coefficient. Coefficient meaning uh, the level of efficiency of the aerodynamic factors. Chris, while you're looking at how engineers work with aerodynamics, here's some things the drivers have to consider. As your car travels by itself, there's a constant flow of air over the nose, the roof, the deck lid, and the spoiler that helps keep the rear end down. It's a delicate balance of speed and downforce. When another car pulls up on your rear bumper, it can disturb that balance by taking air off the front car's rear spoiler and the rear car's hood, causing instability for both. It's a situation where the aerodynamics of the wind tunnel meets the reality of the racetrack. This is nothing more than like a dyno is for an engine. You gotta take it all with a grain of salt and with an open mind. It's nothing cast in stone because there is a lot of variables. Uh, the car's not squatting as it does in the corners. The wheels aren't turning. The motor's not running. But it's just a tool to, to learn things and then take them and go to the racetrack and see if the wind tunnel has given you the correct information or not. And we have found uh, instances where the wind tunnel would give us direction one way, but it would go the other way on the racetrack. Did you ever think when you decided you were going to go racing that uh, you'd be in this sort of a laboratory as much as you are? No, I really didn't. <laughs> I remember the first time I come here, I really couldn't get into the to the information it was giving us because I was so starry-eyed over this facility, but uh, now I guess I'm down to kind of ground level and trying to look at the data and conceive from it and, and learn from it, but no, I, I never really dreamed we'd be coming up here four, five, six times a year trying to improve our race car. Many as we've seen here today, technology continues to play an important part in the development of race cars for the Winston Cup Series. It also further demonstrates the sharing of technology that goes on in the industry, technology that goes both to the racetrack and to the showroom. Aerodynamics or body design play a crucial role in all racing, but perhaps nowhere is it as critical as on super speedways. And when you think of the masters of super speedways, you can't help but think of the Wood Brothers. As car owners and mechanics, they've won more races on super speedways. Now that's tracks like Daytona, Charlotte, Talladega, and here at Darlington than anyone else. Some of the greatest drivers of all time have driven for Glenn and Leonard Wood. I had a chance to go spend some time with them and share some of their favorite war stories.
sitting talking to the Wood Brothers. I mean, what is, who are the Wood Brothers? Glenn? Well, I don't know. Uh, Leonard and myself started this thing several years ago. and When? What year did you start? 1950. Well, how were you, Leonard, in night when you started this? Fifteen. Fifteen years old? Yes, um, uh, I guess Glenn's first race car uh, engine was built by Curtis Turner's mechanic, and uh, that went in his first race car, and then uh, my father rebuilt it a couple of times, and then I was probably 16 when I started building his engines, and I remember one time we was... Uh, had bought this new four and a half inch stroker kit, you know, and uh, I was in the back room and this uh, com competition came in and we was trying to get the engine together, you know, and uh, we bought this set of pistons from California, had a real narrow ring in it, uh, unlike any of the others we was using, and I broke one. So I had to take a, one of the older ones, thick ones, and grind it down and put it in there, but anyway, it, uh, it ran all right. And you was the driver. Yeah, I started, was a crew chief. I started out driving. Uh, actually, there's about five different ones started that was going to just build a race car, and nobody was designated to drive it. And after we got through with it, uh, it turned out that me, and myself, and Chris Williams uh, started all together, and uh, so it ended up I had to drive it. So it just turned out that way and we just in fact we burnt the first one up after the first race literally it caught on fire and burned <laughs> we had hooked a, a sort of a rear bump of a car uh, and towing it home it you know rung axle off and it fell down on the road and sparks caught the gas tank of fire and it burned it down right in the middle of the road over the years leonard what's the biggest change in auto racing since you started when you were 16 years old. What do you think is the biggest change? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. The one thing that, that I see has changed that's, that's making it hard to be competitive is used to, if you had a, you just didn't let anybody look at your car. I mean, nobody saw your secrets. You didn't tell your secrets. Nobody told you theirs. But now, if, uh, if you want to, any, any top team in this garage could go to another top team, and if they was in trouble, they would help them. And, and then, uh, let's say, 10 teams will get together and share secrets. And then on down the road, people can come in and buy the top-rate equipment and the, and the secrets and everything when you didn't used to could do that. Well, and when did you go, when did you go to Indianapolis? Uh the Wood Brothers went to Indy. When was that? 1965. Ford wanted us to come up and pit Jim Clark, and uh, we came into this English uh, garage, and we were supposed to take his car over just and make a pit stop, and but uh, they didn't resent it. Didn't seem to resent it at all. It would have been much harder to do if they had a, but they just seemed to welcome us to come in and they let us do anything we wanted to in preparations to make a th uh, to prepare for a pit stop you know but you didn't change tire. did that car run all day with no tire change right? we didn't have to change tires but we was prepared to we it fitted all the dial pins and the wheels you know to fit on uh, smoothly and and uh, we had uh, uh, my brother ray checking the tires for depth you know the wear depth every time you know and if it had been a, a wear problem, we would have certainly changed. As I remember correctly, that was very successful, that uh, pit crew, when you went to Indy that time, wasn't it? Well, I guess it's the most publicity we ever got in our lives and did the least. <laughs> <laughs> it was not that big a deal, huh? No, I mean, it, it, uh, it was just a fun thing after <laughs> it's all over. Now, once you stopped driving, you've had a lot of different drivers. Uh, who, the first driver you had when you was who? Panch. Marvin Panch. Yeah, Marvin Panch. And then he was injured. Tiny Lund got relief for him in the Daytona 500 and won the 500. Right. Yes. Was, was that your biggest thrill up to then? It and uh, Pearson. Oh, up to then, sure. But it, it sticks in our mind as well as uh, Pearson and Petty. And was, when did 
Pearson join your team as a driver, David Pearson? 72. 72, and he drove up and through 78 or? 78. And that mm -hmm. had to be, those six years had to be probably the finest six years that any driver team has ever enjoyed. It was. We had a, Pearson was a, a type guy that uh, he never told you, he always made it look like he couldn't do what he could do. He always played it down. And he'd, he'd always come through with more than what he said he was going to do. As a driver? Yeah. Like, uh, for instance, that race with he and Petty, he says, I'm doing all I can do. He says, I can't pass him. But he did, you know, <laughs> going down the back straightaway. I mean, uh, he always wanted to, I don't think he did it just to be uh, uh, not tell us the truth. I think he wanted to have a satisfaction of doing what he said he could do, you know. I mean, he didn't want to say he could do it and not do it. The last six or seven years, the success has not been nearly as great as it was in the 70s with Pearson. Any reason for that, Glenn, that you know of? Well, it's, it's a lot tougher now, and, and I guess some of them got a little ahead of us in some areas by there's some bigger sponsors than we had out there. And, uh, and it all adds up. Uh, we've, we've tried just as hard, it seemed like, and it, it's hard to answer that question. Glenn, when you drove, who was the toughest race car driver you drove against? Well, I just have to go back to Curtis Turner, I think. He was, I guess, my inspiration to, to be a racer. We used to watch him, and he grew up near us, and he was my racing idol, I guess. He, he was tough. Uh, you, you well know that. Uh, he, he was one of the greatest, uh, I think, that ever lived. Who of you... I mean, this is a hard question, and I don't know if you have an answer for it, but who as a driver have you enjoyed the most over the years, Leonard? Well, you know, they, they all got different qualities. Each one's got, uh, you know, I, I don't never really like to point out any driver and compare them, you know, but uh, all of them's uh, uh, record, you know, speaks differently. And then there's some of them got one thing that stands out in your mind. I know uh, A.J. Fort, when he relieved from Marvin Pants in 1965, we didn't have radios and you couldn't, you couldn't get drivers to look at you too much, you know, or acknowledge your signal that you give them on a, a blackboard. And A.J. would come by and he'd turn his head square at you and look straight at you and give you the signal every time. I guess it's because, you know, running Indy, you know, it, it has run so fast they had to learn to look at it, but he was the best there ever was reading that board, and then he'd, he'd just smile at you if he's running good. But you asked who was the most interesting driver, uh, and I would have to say I had the most fun working with Glenn and I, you know. Uh, we had a good relationship, you know, uh, mechanic and driver, and uh, it was the most interesting for us too. And I remember the first race he won over there, at Bowman Gray, it, it had a, uh, the brakes would go down every time he'd go back on the racetrack, he'd go to the floor. And he'd come back in, he says, I know it sounds like I'm lying, but says, the brakes go to the floor, and it'd be full pedal when he get back in. So we discovered exhaust was blowing on the master cylinder while it was wide open, and heating the master cylinder and the boiling fluid, and it'd go in the floor. So we took exhaust completely off the left side, and it was nothing but just to, uh, exhaust coming off of the block, you know, on a flathead, and it sounds terrible, but he won the race. In the 1970s, NASCAR fans witnessed one of those rare times in sports when an athlete and his team completely gel. The result is magic. The team was the Wood Brothers and the driver was David Pearson. Their combination of speed and precision made them nearly invincible and helped create a legend. Third on our list, the man known as the Silver Fox is David Pearson. It didn't matter where Pearson was running, he could be back in the pack, but you always knew he would be there at the end, and he always was. When Pearson was behind the wheel, his car always had something left when it was time to charge for the checkered flag. That flag came down 105 times, placing him second on the career win list. Pearson won three championships for Cotton Owens and then Holman and Moody, and was the acknowledged master of Darlington 
with 10 wins on this track. Back again this issue with another tip on how you can drive like a pro is my old buddy DW, Darrell Walter. Thanks, Benny. You know, a lot of race fans are convinced that having lightning fast reaction times is the most important part of being a race driver. Sure, there are times on the racetrack, just as there are on the highway, when something unexpected happens and you have to react fast to save your hide. But most of the time you can avoid having to react fast by anticipating problems. At the speed we're traveling, you have to concentrate on looking far ahead to anticipate trouble. At 180 miles per hour, you're traveling at 265 feet every second. So if you need to slow the car down or change its direction, you need a little bit of notice. This gets harder on a steeply banked oval, especially a track like Bristol, where the track disappears into the top of the windshield. It seems like you're always scrunching down to get a better look at the track ahead by looking up instead of straight ahead. On the highway, it's a little easier job since you don't have to peep through the top inch of the windshield to see where you're going. But many drivers make the mistake of keeping their eyes too low. On a straight section of highway, you can easily see other cars that are one quarter of a mile ahead if you look for them. Unfortunately, a lot of folks focus their eyes just barely past the hoods of their cars. If you're focusing your attention on the taillights of the car directly in front of you, you have to go to the brakes quickly when you see the brake lights come on or you're going to close the gap in a blink. Now, if you raise your eyes and look beyond the car directly in front, and really stretch your vision to see five or ten cars ahead, you can play a game called Beat the Brake Lights. It goes like this. You should try to drive so much like a pro that the brake lights of the car in front of you never goes on before yours do. The strategy for winning the game is to look so far down the road ahead that you find the reasons for braking before the other drivers around you. If you try, you should easily beat the driver directly in front of you. The more cars in line ahead of you that break after you do, the better you're anticipating. How do you see that far ahead? After all, there are cars in the way. Well, there are a few tricks. The first is that every car in front of you has a back window and a windshield. And if that driver can see through them, so can you. The trick is only worth about two cars ahead before the view gets fuzzy. Another trick is to squeeze over to the left side of your lane a little, seeing the left side taillights of all the cars ahead. As you're driving, keep moving your eyes ahead as far as you can see, then back again towards the cars closest to you, sweeping the traffic front to back. Remember, it's valuable to be able to quickly react to highway situations, but by using the same skills we use on the racetrack, like the skills of anticipation, you can drive smart and drive like a pro. And speaking of pros, let's take a look again at the drivers who placed 10th through 3rd in the NASCAR Video Magazine poll a group I'm proud to be a part of. Well folks, as you can see, there are only two spots left and we'll fill you in and introduce you to those drivers in just a minute. But first, Bob Jenkins takes a look at some of the top drivers of today who didn't make the list, but have a chance to move up in the future. Well, Benny, you're right. These drivers certainly have made a name for themselves in Winston Cup racing in the past few years, but not quite enough votes to get into the top ten. I think we can expect them to be there, however, in the next few years. The four drivers are Bill Elliott. He followed up his million-dollar win season in 1985 with a championship in 1988 and has racked up impressive wins on NASCAR super speedways. He was close to breaking into the list and with a few more winning seasons, he has a real chance to make it. Rusty Wallace, the 1989 champion and a winner of 18 races in just the past five years. His new Penske team seems to be gelling quickly and has the potential to be one of the Winston Cup Series big winners in the seasons to come. Mark Martin came close in his championship quest in the past two seasons and certainly has a bright future ahead. But I think he needs to win consistently to start attracting voters in the future. Jeff Bodine, he could be considered a dark horse contender. He does have a Daytona 500 win, and third in the final 1990 point standings was his best ever. But it will take a championship and a few more big wins to help him crack into the top ten. Thanks, Bob. 
What about Ernie Irvin, winner of the 1991 Daytona 500? Alan Kawicki, does he have enough time left to make it? Ricky Rudd, who does so well on the road courses. But now it's decision time. Let's hear from a couple of our voters to find out who their choices were. Richard uh, was consistent for so many years over a period of uh, three decades, 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, smooth, smart, won all those uh, 200 races. So I went with him. It was a very, very tough call because I think that uh, Dale Earnhardt, who was my second choice, has uh, achieved all this success in an era when the sport is much more competitive than it was when Richard uh, was uh, winning quite a few of those races for uh, 100 milers on short tracks and the fields weren't as strong as they consistently are every week now. I'm picking Richard Petty mainly because the guy won 200 races and he's raced for years and decades and continues to race. I think 200 victories is uh, is something special, but probably more significant is the seven Daytona 500s and the seven driving championships. I don't think you can uh, discount those two things. Okay, who did our panel of top racing journalists pick? Well, coming in second, with four Winston Cup championships in the past 11 years, and the man who is the most dominant driver in the sport today, Dale Earnhardt, driver of the number three GM Goodrich Chevrolet. What can you say about Dale? His rise to the top since his rookie season of 1979 is nothing short of phenomenal. You name the track, a short track or super speedway, and he's not only won there, he's dominated. We think of him as a hard charger, and he is, but when the race has called for finesse, there's Dale easing through the turn. But make no mistake about it, when it's time to run in front, he's there, particularly about the time Doyle Ford is getting ready to wave that checkered flag. The truth is, 95% of race car drivers are just about alike. But there's that 5% who have something else. And Dale is at the top of that 5%. I don't know what you call it. People have asked me. But I know he's got it. It's something pretty special. Watching Dale Earnhardt drive a stock car, it's a beautiful thing indeed. Dale has a shot to win several more championships before his career is over. And probably pick up that elusive Daytona 500 win as well. Dale Earnhardt will be the first to tell you there's only one king. And as you've probably guessed by now, the man selected as the greatest stock car driver of all time is Richard Petty. On one hand, you can measure his greatness by looking at the record book. It sounds like a broken record. Most career wins, 200, Richard Petty. Most wins in a season, 26 in 1967, Richard Petty. Most consecutive wins, 10 in a row in 1967. Richard Petty. Most wins from the pole in a career, 61, Richard Petty. And the list goes on, 18 consecutive years with at least one win, seven Winston Cup championships, seven victories at the Daytona 500, Richard Petty. No one even comes close, probably never will. Hey, I thought I knew something about driving until I raced against Richard Petty. Just being on the track with him showed me how much I had to learn before I could even call myself a race car driver. He just flat out blew my mind. But the story of the King's greatness goes beyond what Richard does on the track. It's the man himself. He transcends the sport. Win or lose, he's the same. There's that same big smile and the love he has for the sport and the love he has for the fans. I mean, man, you can feel it. There's no doubt Richard Petty, the greatest stock car driver of all time. Well, that about does it for this issue of NASCAR Video Magazine. We'll be back in a couple of months, but in the meantime, do me a favor, drop me a line. Did you agree with our picks for the top 10? Is there anything you'd like to see us cover in future issues? This is your magazine. Let us know what you think. Write to me, Benny Parsons at NASCAR Video Magazine, 1435 North Meridian Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46202. We'll see you on our next issue. So long, everyone. Following this edition of NASCAR Video Magazine is a new music video by Atlantic recording artist Martin Delray with special guest Johnny Cash.